I'd like to call this meeting to order at 7 p.m. Tony? Adoption of the agenda. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Chris, Michelle, second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Just mixed it up a little bit, that's all. All right, presentations. Right, so we have a few presentations this evening. The, the first couple are some field trips, and the first one is a, a trip uh, with a music program to Virginia. And we've asked Mr. Tim Keene, the director of the music program, to come up and uh, give a quick some quick information to the board and then give uh, the board Good evening, you. everyone. Uh, this trip is for the band and chorus and color guard to uh, Virginia Beach, April 12th through the 15th. Uh, anticipated cost is a range from 645 to 745. Um, I think you have the details before you. I do want to mention um, any cost uh, to the Board of Ed we have eliminated. We have built in two additional chaperone comps through Destinations Unlimited. Uh, the comps will be reserved first for any adults that are required to attend. Um, repainting comps will be built on a first come, first serve basis. And this should eliminate the need of any expenses uh, through the Board of Ed. Uh, the only expense would probably be for a sub for myself. Uh, I don't think they want to leave me behind. Um, Julie Kozakowski is here from Destinations Unlimited uh, to help answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Any, any questions? Comments? I just, um, I want to make sure that before we go any further, we know for a fact there's no cost to the Board of Ed. No special transportation, no pairs needed, no extra substitute other than your own for here, um, and that we are completely clear on that side of things. We have seven comps through Destinations Unlimited, which means you know seven adults will will be going for free. The um, those seven will be first filled on needs of students based on IEP or 504 uh, requirements. So unless we have more than seven of those people, which I doubt would ever happen, um, there will be no costs. Is there any additional transportation costs if, if that comes up? No. No. I'll just add to that if it's all right. Um, just move a little closer, honey. Sorry. Thanks. All the costs are included, transportation, there's no hidden costs whatsoever. After uh, Mr. Keene and I had a long discussion, and um, some of you probably know, but there were two students last year that required one-on-one -on -one aid for that particular trip. Of course, when you do a trip, you have no idea who's going to sign up, so we didn't know that going forward this year. So after we talked about it, I said, let's put two more. It's just in the trip, so if those individuals want to go, and like he said, normally we do one per ten, so normally it would be four chaperones plus Mr. Keene as the director. So we actually put two more in to cover those additional, and I think he only has two students that it may apply to anyways, but if it did, it would go, you know, we'd fill those first with the students that have the needs and then fill in with additional chaperones. Does that answer the question? It does on your end, but on our end, is there an impact as far as if, if those particular students needed their parents to attend, how does that impact the students back here? Are they one-on-one? -on -one? Would we potentially have to have more staff here? Can I just make a, a, an observation from experience that typically when a child goes out of state, 
it's a parent that fills in that position. It's not one of our staff that goes. Does that answer your question? You but. use the word typically. <laughs> I need to make sure right, that before right. I vote on this, we have, we've already talked about there's no funding for field trips okay. on the Board of Ed level. I mean, I guess for, I mean, I've never seen a parent and another staff or a staff go outside of the state because no. typically the parents want to be that person. We, we deal with towns all over the state of Connecticut. It's always a parent that goes and rooms with that child. I have never seen a school staff member or a para go and room with a child. You know, if it was a one-day trip, I've seen that where the school sends a para, but not on an overnight. What about... I'm sorry. I just want Barbara if she can come out. I, I, again, that's what I've typically seen. I cannot say if you as the parent would not attend I, I can't refuse and, and not allow it, but I would say that that's been my experience too, that in general it's usually been apparent if it's an out of state. I guess the word is historically, not typically, because mm -hmm. I've been in this district now 20 years and I've never seen it any other way. Mm -hmm. So history, yes, <clears throat> but if again, could, if there's a... If I could just add, having done many of these trips, the only staff that I can remember being required would be some type of nurse. Um, but I, I don't believe that's the case at in And we, the last few years, Terryville has not had a nurse on the trip. We actually have um, one of the chaperones that generally goes that, um, what's an ENT or EMT? Did that wrong. Trey, correct me, where are you? <laughs> um, so we've had them on board. So they were a chaperone and an EMT. This particular trip, though, goes to Virginia. Mm -hmm. And Virginia has very strict rules about um, the health requirements and the nurse the nurse requirements where I spoke to our head nurse and there would be a concern that um, if we had students who needed to have medication administered by a nurse then we would need to have a nurse present so you know there's all kinds of doctor's orders where kids can carry and um, administer mm -hmm. but not all students will necessarily have that and there could be students who elect to go who um, may not be in a position to administer. So just for full disclosure, I can't say that there's not a student who wouldn't require a nurse. And so if that was the case, that either is going to have to be another one of those spots that you're talking about. Right, which it could be. And I know other school districts that require a nurse, if that's the case, and the Board of Ed says, yes, you have to have a nurse. Sometimes there's a parent that's a nurse that will volunteer their time and be one of the chaperones, and they're also a nurse. A lot of schools do that as well. Yeah. I guess for, I, I'm going to talk for the board. We just, and especially some of our board, they, they want a guarantee, and I understand that because of what's going on. Mm -hmm, um, absolutely. So I appreciate that you kind of were forthcoming with the information that we you knew we were going to ask. Absolutely. So um, any other questions or comments or concerns? I want to play devil's advocate here, Mr. Keene, but <clears throat> personally I was embarrassed by what we did to you in the last board of that meeting where you stood up there and asked for <clears throat> two field trips to one to uh, Eastern States, the Big E, and the other one was to uh, New York City for the Columbus Day Parade. And you left here knowing that we were going to give it to you, and then about a half hour later, we took it all away from you. So I don't want to be put in that, me personally, I don't want to get put in that situation where I give it to you, and then next month I take it away from you. Okay, so I just want to make sure that liability issue with this trip is covered on everybody's basis, both the Board of Ed and yourself. So if you do need a nurse and you look into what Virginia law is and says that if there are students that are going to need to have some type of medication and Virginia says that there has to be a nurse present, I would definitely cover your base. Mm -hmm. I really would. And if you can get that on a pro bono basis, if you can get a parent who is a nurse and decide to go for free, so be it. I would make sure that you cover your basis so that there's no liability issues if something does happen. Well, I'll just add that I know this year in particular is a very difficult year, and we appreciate the field trip that we worked on, the, the Big E trip, which was very successful. Um, it's just one of those years, like 
no year I've ever experienced. I'm sure you were all in the same position. Um, but if we do need a nurse, we'll get a nurse. And that will be one of the seven comps. So we could guarantee that. The only cost I could see is if the school system wanted a nurse substitute. And we would. Yeah, Can I, I address the liability for a minute? Um, it depends what type of liability you're asking, but one of the benefits of using a tour company to do a field trip is there is another huge layer of liability because we have to have errors in liability insurance versus if someone plans a trip on their own, they have none of that. So um, that's, you know, we cover all that. And if the Board of Ed needs a copy of that, I can get it to them too. Um, and I think just on a personal, can I share a personal story? Is that all sure. right? So I graduated from THS in 1985. In 1984, there was a language teacher here that reinstated field trips to France and Spain for the first time in many, many years. Parents were all upset and should they let the kids go and this and that, and it was really a to-do. We all got to go. That trip influenced the course of my life. I now work in tourism because of that teacher. Fast forward a few years, I'm going to pick on Mr. Perkins because I know he's here, but we were talking and he was telling me how this teacher really influenced his life and how he got to go to Europe. And I said, you're talking about Mr. Blagiron. He said, yep. Fast forward another couple years, I'm at open house at Eli Terry and one of the language teachers who I knew as a little girl but did not recognize her, she had been married, different name, didn't know, we're talking and she said, you know, I had this language teacher who really affected my life. We went to Europe. I said, what's your name? And then we put it together and I knew her and she was many years younger than me, but she had gone on that trip. So I understand your concerns, but I also think that it's a fabulous opportunity and I'd hate to take it away from the band and choir students. I am a member of this town or, you know, um, I live in this town and I will do everything under my power to make sure that there's no cost to the Board of Ed. I'm working with Mr. Keene and I see sad faces over there. They're involved in the music department and um, I just would like them to be able to have that opportunity. And I don't have anybody in the music department anymore, so um, it's just close to my heart. Uh, can I have uh, Mr. Holtz come up? We have a question. So if we need to have the substitute for Mr. Keene, how are we going to handle that? Are we going to rotate a person into his room within the building? For Mr. Keene, when you consider the number of students that go on this trip, um, the majority of his caseload really happens in two, three periods anyhow, and mm -hmm. most of those students are going to be on that. Okay. Um, his other classes, such as the music lab and some of the piano classes, are kept kind of small just based on equipment, so you're talking eight, nine kids. Um, so realistically, we could be looking at just having those students attend a study hall for that day or two. Okay. Does that answer the next question that's going to come out? Because that was my next question. All right. Any other questions or concerns or comments, discussion? I do have one quick question. That I don't know if it helps the board or makes the discussion longer than you want. But if, if, the, if the board does approve the trip and then we identify that a potential cost comes up that you weren't anticipating, um, something significant, you know, something in the multi-hundreds or into the thousands of dollars, um, what would be... A timeline in terms of saying you know what we thought we were going to handle this trip but because there's going to be cost to the board we not this year we just will have to bail out and where are the rest of the folks who want to go aren't losing money like is there a, a timeline where you could say we're going to stop this and no one's lost a dollar basically up to 60 days before so into February I, I want to mention as well friends of music uh, historically have given up to $5,000 for this trip uh, through fundraising. So it can be determined if there's an additional cost, some of that money could be channeled into those expenses. Gotcha. Okay. Any more comments, questions, or concerns? Do I do a roll call vote? All right. Mike? We don't have a motion yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Motion. I'd like to make a motion to approve an out-of-state field trip for approximately 60 students in grades 9 through 12 in the music department at Terryville High School to Virginia Beach, Virginia 
offered through Destinations Unlimited from April 12th through April 15th, 2018. Second. Mike, second, thank you. All right. Yes. Melissa? Yes. Chris? Yes. Tony? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Jerry? Yes. Roxanne? No. Karen? Yes. Okay. Yes, have it. <clears throat> thank you. If I could just give a quick plug on Friday night is our uh, big Berkshire League Music Festival, which we are hosting. It's 7.30, so if you're available, you don't want to miss that. It's going to be great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we have a second trip, um, far closer to home, and just for a day. And I just asked, I'd like to ask Mr. Perkins to come up and talk about his trip to New York. I think Mr. Perkins has a few students with him. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. Uh, we're asking for... Uh, approval to go to New York on April 11th to participate in two workshops. Uh, 40 students will be attending. Approximately 20 of them will attend the, um, for the crew, from the crew portion of Drama Club, will attend a prop and set design and creation seminar with a, uh, a professional prop maker uh, who's worked on a number of shows and we actually met with her last year on the trip. And 20 students will be attending the uh, singing and dancing with the cast and uh, direct, musical director and ca dance captain from the Broadway show Aladdin. And um, we're, uh, it's a day trip and uh, we're in, we attend the seminars in the morning and the afternoon we see the matinee of the show Aladdin. And uh, I'm going to let the students talk about it because they, uh, they have a much better perspective than I have. Hello, my name is Hayden and I am part of the cast of THS Drama. Um, before we actually went to Broadway, we received um, sheet music from one of the songs uh, from last year's trip, which was uh, To Wicked. Um, so this is not the first time we've done this trip. And um, we were tasked to learn it before we got there so that we had a foot up. Um, and we did successfully. Uh, we were also taught a lot of improv on the spot, a lot of dancing, choreography, movements, much like um, actual Broadway performers would experience. They would get the script, music first, and they would have their um, instruction on movements <coughs> after. And I feel that it gave a very uh, realistic view into a more professional setting of uh, what we do in um, a bit more of a step back, and uh, I did find it very um, introspectful into how hard people work for, you know, what they uh, what they enjoy. But um, my uh, associate Nolan can tell you more about that. Hello, I'm Nolan Stack. I am also a member of the Terrible Drama Club. I also went to the trip, and I found it all inspiring how person that started off in a small club or organization ended up being a member of Broadway and ended up teaching us how to sing, dance, and act. Hi, I'm Jerry Jeunesse. I went to the prop and set design of a class and um, they showed us how to make like lots of props and like, um, no, props and um, we plan on using some of like their props in our um, Upcoming performance on October 27th and 28th. Uh, I got a lot from that trip. My sisters have both been to um, Broadway. I've gone, I think, all four years that I've been here. So, you know, now, <laughs> hopefully. Um, and I really hope that you give us the opportunity to do this again. Thank you. So the trip in total is $185 uh, per person and the cost is being borne uh, by the students uh, through their personal funds and, uh, and fundraisers that we already do as a part of the Drama Club. The, uh, the goal is obviously get the per person cost out of pocket for the students down below 185, but the students are all committed. If, if you give the approval tonight, one way or another, we're gonna you know, get $185 to cover each person, which covers our transportation, the seminar, and the, the show ticket. 
Any questions? Mm -hmm. Concerns? Chair? Chris, I just have a quick question. In your application, you're stating that the bus cost is approximately $1,300. But then you just stated that the trip's going to cost $185 per person, which is going to include costs. So I think there's a little contradiction in your field trip excursion request where you have a bus cost of $1,300, but yet the cost is included in the price of the, the student's cost. The, the $1,300 is the bus cost. And then the 185 the, would cover part. Yeah. Part of the 185 would cover the bus. Yeah, cost. approximately fifty dollars of that 185 dollars goes towards the bus. Yeah. The ticket to the show and the seminar is about 135 dollars. So you're saying approximately fifty for each kid's going towards the bus. Towards the bus. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I just need clarification because, like I said, I'm looking at the application. Okay. Yeah, you're saying that there's thirteen hundred dollars for buses, and then there's. You're saying that the cost of the ticket, of the price of getting on the bus, is going to include the cost of the of the transportation. So I just want to make sure when I'm voting, I'm not voting on something that is going to contradict later on. Okay, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, much like the last field trip, do you have do you foresee any hidden costs with needing um, or students needing the assistance to attend? Um, at this time, we don't. Currently, I don't have any drama club students. Uh, who are anticipating going on the trip uh, or eligible to go on the trip who uh, ha need additional support. Okay, thank you. Anything else? I'd like to make a motion to approve an out-of-state field trip for approximately 35 students in grades 9 through 12 in the Drama Club at Terryville High School to New York City, New York on Wednesday, April 11th, 2018 from 5.45 a.m. until approximately 8.45 p.m. Second. second. Mike, second. Any other discussions before I call for the vote? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Rexham? No. Jerry, no. no. Any abstentions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the things, the next part of our evening is we're going to do two presentations, one for Mr. Holtz, he's going to talk about uh, a number of the different data pieces that we look at the high school, so he's going to look at things like the SAT, college acceptance report, and advanced placement information, and then later on Mr. Vigliotti is going to work with Ms. Parsons and we're going to talk about social emotional learning. Um, both these are connected to our goals that we just adopted last month, so we thought this would be a good idea to uh, bring you this information tonight. And uh, at each of the additional board meetings, we'll, we'll likely be doing presentations connected directly back to the goals that you approved back in um, September. All right, so we'll start with Mr. Holtz and the high school report. Good evening. Thank you. Um, a little bit shorter than last year. We've, uh, we've taken the cap out since the state's not using it anymore. And we've kind of abbreviated the SAT a little bit, and I'll share with you why in just a moment. So last year was the second year that all of our juniors took the SAT per the state, um, and that's with the revised SAT. So right there you can see our scores from last, I think it was April 5th that we did it. Um, if you look at the average or the mean score for both the reading and the math versions, um, they had gone up quite a bit, which I'll share with you on the next slide. A big focus that the state is looking at is that proficiency. Um, so we had 62% of our students uh, at the benchmark or above in reading, and we had 42% in math. When you compare the state, um, so both Terryville High School and the state went up a little bit last year, we did close the gap on the state. Um, I want to say for our reading, we went up about 5%. The state only went up 1%. And our math, I think we went up uh, nearly 10 And I think the state only went up 3 or 4 So while we're either at the level of the state or a little behind, we have started to close that gap over this past year. So in past, I've shared with you five years' worth of data. Um, and you're not really comparing apples to apples. And I've tried to share that before. Uh, the big difference is, one, you're talking about two versions of the SAT. 
And then the second is, in the old SAT, it was really quite selective. So it was really only the juniors um, who are looking to necessarily pursue college that were taking it, where the last two years, it's mandatory for all 11th graders. Um, with that being said, our mean averages, which I had on the former slide, are actually the highest average we've seen in the five-year span. Um, I think I, that says quite a bit when you consider the fact that now instead of 60, 70 students taking it, you have 100, 110. Um, over the last year, though, uh, just comparing the last two junior classes that we had, you can see that we have gone up substantially in the reading, um, nearly 10 points on the average, and right around 4.5% going up in terms of the proficiency mark. And then for math, um, there's definitely a, a large gap that we have started to put on. Um, increasing nearly 20 points on the average and about 9% there on the proficiency. So we're quite pleased with the last junior class that came through. Um, they really took to some of the instructional and tutoring stuff that we put into place uh, and I think their efforts show right there. I think this is worth looking at too. Uh, ironically today was our PSAT day. It's kind of the national PSAT day. Um, so all of our 9th, 10th, and 11th graders were engaged in the PSAT for three, four hours this morning. Um, so right here what we're comparing is last year's junior class. They too took the PSAT uh, in October. And then later on in April of that same junior year, then they, they then took the SAT. So one thing that's kind of comparing apples to apples is the proficiency. Um, the benchmarks move a little bit based on what the College Board sets. Um, but regardless, we did have an increase of students, both in the reading and the math, that were able to hit that benchmark or exceed it. And you can see that on the right side. What I think is important to note is that the way the SAT or the College Board sets their benchmarks, they don't want to say it's a predictor, although it kind of is. Um, they kind of talk out of both sides of their mouth when they talk about the benchmarks and predictions. Um, but what I will tell you is that the benchmark from a junior taking the PSAT in October to a junior taking the SAT in the spring is 20 point change. So if you were to consider that, our students that did the reading test at 473, if they had gone up the 20 points that the College Board is kind of deeming as a normal growth, we'd be looking at 493 for an average. So we have surpassed the expected growth over that period of time in reading. Likewise, if you were to look at the math, um, that 459 that they had scored in terms of an average score in October, if you were to add the 20 point shift of the benchmark, that would be 479. Our students far surpassed that and grew a substantial amount over that short period of time from October to April. So now we'll talk about AP or advanced placement. Um, this we do have a five year track. Um, you have seen many of these numbers with the exception of the 2017. Um, there's a couple things that I think are worth noting here. Uh, one is that we have started to see a little bit of an increase again in terms of our percent of students scoring a three or higher on the AP. Uh, it still is not at a level that we want it to be at. Um, but what I think is something that we're really proud of is the drastic increase in terms of number enrolled in AP courses and the actual AP students. Um, so just to clarify what that is, that first line going across that's basically like students sitting in seats. Um, so if we have a student that takes three AP classes, they count as three students in that column. If you look at total AP students, that's the unique student. So whether I take one AP class or four AP classes, I count as one student. Um, I did highlight on the bottom there that this current year, we have 193 seats taken up in our <coughs> AP classes, and that consists of 101 unique students. So we have drastically grown our AP program. We have opened those doors up, and we have students that are wanting to take those classes. Um, I think there's a handful of reasons why we're seeing such an increase. Uh, over the last couple of years, I think we've really had um, some consistency with our staff in those classes. They've built a rapport for themselves and a reputation in terms of what they can offer the students. Um, I think students are more confident that they can try and get through that class even if they feel like it's maybe a little over their head, it's worth taking that and having that experience. Um, we've also off offered a junior AP English class this year, so that's about another 20 students. And we've also started to push our seniors in the English class um, where they either take the CP class or they jump up to AP. 
So that does represent maybe 35, 40 students increasing from that 128 to the 193. Um, but even with those kind of forceful pushes on the students, we still have that many more students who are just interested in that experience. They recognize the benefit in terms of how well it prepares them for the college. Uh, another shining moment from the class of 2017. Uh, every year I share with you the four-year college uh, enrollment and two-year and then some of the miscellaneous stuff. Um, in 2016, we saw quite a bit of a dip in terms of students attending four-year colleges. Not really sure what that was, uh, what the reason was. Um, but class of 2017 left here ready to go into the four-year schools. Um, and even if you look at the two-year, so if you, combine, if you combine those, we're nearly 90% of our students feel like they're ready to attend a two or four year program. Um, and then you can see some of the miscellaneous. Um, so certainly something that we wanna encourage our students. Um, we're hoping that through our programming and the work that we do in the classes with them, that they have that confidence that it's worth putting out that tuition and they feel like they can make that next step. So moving forward here, um, I have two slides here and I won't read this to you. Uh, but these are some of the strategies that we're kind of working on this year. Uh, the one that I think is really worth highlighting and talking about is the third one down. Um, Ms. Parsons and myself were fortunate enough to have a webinar over the summer uh, with one of the college board representatives and they helped us dig even deeper into the assessment tools that they have. Uh, I was able to play around with quite a bit of it last year but that webinar showed me a couple of additional things. Um, we have access to any tests that our students have taken. Um, we can look at students hitting proficiency, we can look at students that they deem approaching proficiency, we can look at students that are um, needing skills to be strengthened, we can look at individual questions, we can see how our students responded on a specific question compared to the state. Um, we, we can break down any which way that you could possibly imagine. So we have shared that with our departments um, and it's a practice that we plan on utilizing throughout the year. Um, we're able to look at the PSAT from last year and then when we get the results from today, which should be first week of December usually, um, we can dig into even the new stuff and get them ready for the March 21st test. Uh, on this slide, there's, there's one that I'd like to talk about as well. Some of these are um, kind of continuous from last year. Uh, the second bullet, though, is certainly worth noting. Uh, this is something that's going to be coming across your desk more and more in the next couple years. Uh, we will have our visit take place in October of 2019 which means next year we'll be doing our self-study. Um, we have one teacher who's done a visit. I just came back from a visit a couple weeks ago. Uh, hands down the best professional development that I've ever been offered. Um, it greatly helped me see the importance of aligning things in a manner that I haven't seen before. And that's not to say I don't understand the, the importance of alignment, but it just it was so intense and so deep. Um, so it's given us a lot of ideas of how we can start doing some of that work this year. And it's not for the visit. Um, the more that I understand those standards and, and see the benefit of it, if we're living to those standards every day and we're holding ourselves accountable to those standards, um, they're intended to help us improve as a school. So um, with that experience, and we're encouraging a couple other teachers to try and do a visit this year and next year, um, I feel like by aligning all those things and really focusing some of our faculty meetings and PD time, I think we're going to continue to see some growth with the way that we're instructing and assessing our students. And at that point, it concludes my presentation, but any questions that you guys may have. Any questions for the adults? Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. Before I bring up, um, actually, no, we'll just move on to the next piece. The, uh, the next piece is all about social emotional learning. As you guys know, that's one of our focuses for for not just this year, but we intend to have this be an intentional part of our practice as we as we move for the rest of this year and, and onward into into the future. So like I said, Mr. Vigliotti, assistant principal here at the high school, and Ms. Parsons are going to be talking to you to give you a brief update on where we are so far. Mr. Vigliotti. Thank you, Dr. Sum. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so we're here to talk a little bit about social emotional learning, which uh, as Dr. Semmel just mentioned is one of our primary goals for the district this year, which he presented, you know, last month at the meeting. Um, so we're just going to go through a little bit of kind of why and where we're headed with this, what we've been doing and, and where we're going. Um, so really what we're looking at here with social emotional learning is 
how do we really build the strongest school communities we can in our district, in our individual buildings, and then collectively in the town? And how do we really give students those skills they need to leave after graduation and go out into the world and do all the great things that we know they're going to be able to do? So when we talk about lifelong learning, social emotional learning is a huge piece of that. So what we've done so far, um, you know, and I'm gonna go through a few other slides quickly right after this, is really taking kind of some anecdotal conversations from last year, talking with the administrative staff around the district, talking with teachers, working with students. We really felt like there was a need to give some intentional opportunities for students to practice some of the kind of interpersonal and intrapersonal skills that are necessary, not just to you know, the academic learning, but really everything that they're trying to accomplish um, in their life. And we, at, the, at our admin retreat this summer, you know, we had some opportunity to really discuss um, how would we go about doing that. And so when we looked at social emotional learning, we, we really started looking at some different models and we started looking at, and this is really kind of a national movement that's emerging at this point to really intentionally focus on, on these, these aspects of, of a student's learning, we really focused on a couple of, of core ideas. First, that social emotional learning is foundational to all learning. Um, and that we really need to be intentional about our practices. And I, I know I've already said that word a couple of times, but really it, it is important to understand the difference between building a relationship because that's just the way I am and really thinking about what opportunities do we have in schools, in our classes, in our you know, larger school communities to develop relationships intentionally. Um, and so we, we really want to emphasize moving forward that thinking about social emotional learning in the same way that we would think now about academic learning is really what we're shooting for as we move forward into the future. So we started with some uh, teacher PD at the beginning of the year around building a common understanding of really what the definition of social emotional learning is and I'll get to that in another moment when I show you um, our model and this idea of a focus on relationship building and school connectedness. So there's a lot of research that supports the idea that relationships and connectedness actually, when students report that they feel more connected to their school, they actually perform better academically, which I think, you know, intuitively all makes sense to us, that if we feel like this is a place we wanna be, this is a place where we're much more likely to have positive learning outcomes. Um, so this work up here that you see, um, where under the heading Truly Connected, these are some things that teachers generated reflecting on their own experiences that made them feel truly connected to school. So we, we started with having teachers kind of think about what are some of the things that really made you feel like you were connected to your, your school experience and then we worked from there. Um, the framework that we're working with comes from an organization um, called CASEL which is the Collaborative for Academic, Social and Emotional Learning. Um, it's kind of a leading worldwide organization and really what you can see here, it's color-coded. Uh, you've got two intrapersonal skills, two interpersonal skills in this idea of that it all leads to this ability to make responsible decisions. So when I talk about being intentional, um, really what we want to do in this first year is bring all staff to the point where we're comfortable with this model and we understand a little bit more about what each one of these five competencies mean and and moving down the road the idea would be how do we look for opportunities in our buildings and in our classes to practice self-awareness and to educate students about self-management and responsible decision making and these types of things not necessarily always explicitly as a separate lesson and one of the things we want to kind of really hammer home to everybody is that we don't really even think of this as an initiative or something that we're trying to make time for, but this is something that after a few years, it's just a way of being, something that we're always thinking about. So when we're looking at how we do our academics, we're also looking at how do we do our, you know, our social learning and our emotional learning as well. Um, just to speak to some of the things going on here at the high school 
one of the uh, initiatives that we've kind of started this year that we're, we're pretty proud of and I think is going pretty well um, so far is something called Troops, which uh, really what it is is it's a small group of students that are hooked up with a teacher and it's kind of mixed grades. And the idea is to take time every other week. It's, it's during the flex time, so it's on Tuesdays. And really what we're doing is we're allowing the students and that, that teacher to develop you know, the relationships and kind of decide, what do we want to use this time for? What do we want to do? We're not necessarily focused on academics. So we've had people doing all kinds of things. Um, we have you know, up here, for example, some students in one troop were doing some tie-dye. There was some students decorating, uh, that was yesterday, decorating you know, pumpkin cookies. And I was outside throwing the football with a couple of kids yesterday. And it was a beautiful morning. Um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of these kinds of things. And really, the idea here is to build relationships and increase connectedness. Um, in addition, you know, on, the, on the structural side of things, we're looking at things like a grading pilot which you might not immediately connect the idea of grading to social emotional learning, but really when we start thinking about what are the structural opportunities we have to embed some of these things, and we, we start looking at something like how do we grade and how do we assess students, and, and do grades and the, the way students currently think about work, do those, does that help them develop skills like self-management? Does it help them look at what am I able to do right now and how do I go back and maybe revise or figure out where I'm strong or where I need to grow moving forward. And so looking at our assessment practices is one way we can focus on some of those things intentionally to help with skills like self-management. So at this point, I'm going to pass My things turn. over to, yeah. Great. So at our last meeting, we asked for examples from each of the schools, sort of what are you working on? And we're really just getting our feet wet this year working with that framework, but some of the other things that are happening already that we're really, again, being more intentional about is at the middle school, you see a picture on the right of their families, and families, again, cross the grade bands so that sixth graders are starting to meet eighth graders, and they're working with teachers that they might not otherwise have in the school. They're continuing their work with restorative practices, which is really having kids be um, conscious about if there was um, a misbehavior of some sort, why did that happen and how can I restore the people that I may have offended or hurt by that behavior? And they're also, as a staff, going through the school connectedness activities. The state has provided us some activities on school climate and they're working through those with their staff. At Fisher, um, they have what is called paw pennies as part of their PBIS and students earn paw pennies, and then they trade them in for special activities at the end. I've heard there's drumming, there's dancing, there's all kinds of, um, I think there's some STEM activities and science experiments. Um, and also, um, parents who may be at Fisher, you'll see that um, Principal Rohunsky, at the end of her newsletters, really links to videos for parents to see to work on some of these social-emotional skills, and we're also compiling them on the school website, uh, the district website, which you see down on the bottom left. Additionally, at Plymouth, um, Plymouth works with what's called bucket filling and how you fill each other's buckets and you don't dip, you don't take out of somebody's bucket. And at the beginning of the year, we talked about how relationships are sort of like bank accounts. Every interaction you have with somebody either adds to that bank account and make, makes it more positive or detracts from it and puts us in the red. So um, another thing they're working on is reading as a book club, this book called Reaching and Teaching Children Exposed to Trauma. And I know when you, we hear the word trauma, we think something horrible, but really thinking about kids and their experiences and walking in their shoes. So what are the things that um, children experience that may impact, they carry the baggage with them to school? Um, an example is um, parents who may be suffering from depression. That's something that for kids, it's unpredictable at home. Um, they may be children who otherwise appear like nothing else is going on, but they come with a little bit of baggage and we just need to um, work with our approach. So we have also formed a social emotional steering committee and the, this is made up of folks from central office and each of the four schools and our purpose this year is to monitor and form the work this year, create a three year time, uh, three year plan moving forward and to measure the progress and review our feedback and assessment results. Um, so, so far what we have sort of um, informally, the feedback from staff based on the professional learning days has been very positive. 
And we're, again, encouraging people to look at it as a lens with which they deal with everything um, throughout the course of the day instead of an additional initiative. Um, so we will be back to give you future updates in December. And hopefully in February, we'll also have some students with us to share what they are um, learning and appreciating about this as well. Questions? Any questions? Comments? This isn't costing us anything either. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm going to kind of take a point of personal privilege and ask the girls a couple questions. So how did PSATs go, Diana? They were good. <laughs> um, I, I can't really talk, so it's going to sound really weird. But um, obviously they were long. But like we've been exposed to them since ninth grade, so at this point it's, it's familiar. And I have an overall question of the SEL. How are you guys feeling about the social emotional learning so far? Good. Um, personally, for me, I'm also there's a, a not really a club but a committee at our school called the Pouch Patrol. And what it is is the people who were on the committee, the student committee, to um, give questions to the people running for vice principal. So we interviewed Mr. Vigliotti. He felt that he was closest with us. It was, I, there's four seniors, four juniors, and one sophomore. And we're trying to get three more sophomores and four freshmen on the group. And what it is, it's, it's all about uh, school climate. So pouch stands for something that we want everyone to be. So the P stands for positive. O stands for, I forget what O stands for. <laughs> um, but each of them, outgoing. outgoing. There we go. U stands for understanding. C is caring and H is helpful. So the 16 eventually of us are kind of going out of our way in school to try to help our school have a better climate within it and we're going to try to put that also into the communities and we're all involved in troop and that also helps a lot getting especially and we're all in fresh start so we all work with the freshmen and it helps get a better relationship people. with the freshmen so they're not like oh they're seniors they're scary we can't talk to them it makes them a lot more comfortable in our school Brie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, especially with Troop, like, for me as a senior, I actually created friendships with um, freshmen, so it's nice to, like, mix up and have younger people friends with older people. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably yeah. less scary for them, too. Yeah. Well, I'm not scary. <laughs> <laughs> Diana, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, along with that, I feel like also in the classrooms, you can tell that it's kind of having an impact. Like, the teachers are taking a much, or not a much, but, like, a more personal kind of way and I feel like they connect with the students a lot more and through that you kind of you learn differently but it uh, like a lot more students have the ability to like understand things that they really wouldn't in just a typical kind of classroom setting. Very good. Did you hear that Mr. Vigliotti? It's working. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you ladies. Um, next do you have any questions or comments before I move on everybody? All right, superintendent's update. All right, I'll do a, a quick update tonight. First of all, um, budget. I don't know if I should say anything more about the budget, but clearly um, I'm hearing today that you know the leadership on both sides of the legislative um, branch has have been meeting all day long, uh, but it looks like it could be still weeks away before we actually have a, a past budget that's, you know, through all the steps and processes that it needs to go through. So we continue to be in, in contact with, with our representatives. In fact, I spoke to Representative Betts today. I happened to be at the Capitol to see um, the minority, minority leader of the House last week, and I saw the Speaker of the House the week before that as a part of the superintendent's group I'm at. So um, I'm understanding they're getting closer, but we've been hearing that old song and dance now for, for a few weeks. So. Uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, but there's a reality to the budget as well. And um, as of this Friday, there are actually five staff members who Friday will be their last day. Um, and so 
<clears throat> these are hardworking folks that are getting caught up in this budget process, folks that uh, we certainly intended to have here, and now the boards had to make some very tough decisions to try to proactively stay ahead of a situation that it's hard to figure out. So I think you guys are to be commended for making some difficult decisions, but at the same time, we have a reality of folks who will be, who will be leaving us. Um, it also means that some of these folks who are right now working with kids and will be leaving us will be replaced, replaced by more senior staff because um, we eliminated some literacy support. Those literacy support folks are, have more um, seniority within our district, so they'll be replacing those folks. So um, some of our students uh, at the middle school and Fisher will have new teachers starting Monday. In terms of a communication piece, the principals are um, making sure that parents are well aware of the change that's coming so they can actually speak to their children prior to the change happening. Um, in some cases, it's, it, it's not exactly the same, but it's, it's similar to if a, if a teacher leaves for maternity leave, the teacher would be there one day and the, and the next day, you know, they're not and they have a new teacher. Um, but this seems a little bit more final since the budget is, is eliminating the position. So we're doing our best to communicate with parents so that they can make sure that they, you know, talk to their kids and um, go through that. I want to make sure you knew about that. I wanted to turn quickly over to Ms. Parsons just to give you an update quickly on the PD, and then I have one last comment. Sure. Last Friday, we had a professional learning day, and the teachers were involved in three sort of mini sessions throughout the course of the day. The first one um, was something new that we're trying this year. It's called vertical teaming. So teachers in different content areas like science and social studies, um, English language arts, and math, Teachers from kindergarten and pre-K all the way up through grade 12 got together in the same room. And for example, we had kindergarten teachers and 12th grade teachers who teach science together. And they were talking about trends that they see, how do we align the curriculum, what are sort of big items that come up through all the grades. So the, the feedback from that was overwhelmingly positive that um, teachers really liked interacting and hearing what's happening across the continuum and how um, students are sort of growing up through our system. And then in the middle of the day, they worked with their um, grade level or content area teams. And at the end of the day, they had some school-based meetings and um, per sessions where they worked on things like social-emotional learning and some trainings and things like that. So we're starting to plan for our November 7th professional learning day. And hopefully in the morning, we'll be offering what's called choice sessions where teachers will be um, presenting to their peers and sharing ideas with their peers. Um, so we're excited for that. Very good. And the, the last couple of updates I have is, um, is first, just a reminder, and um, I'm sure that Ms. Johnson was going to say the same thing, but it, it'll be helpful to hear it twice. Um, the next Board of Education meeting is, is November 15th. Typically, it would have been November 8th, which is the second Wednesday, but because of the election being on November 7th, um, the board meeting would have occurred the very next day. So uh, we had decided to move the meeting to November 15th. So just to, to make sure that's clear to folks. Um, there's also a Board of Ed retreat on the 8th because there'll be some new members uh, on the Board of Education. So you folks thought it'd be a good idea to, to provide them a good orientation so they, they knew what they'd be up for when they came to their first official meeting here. And with that, my last thought, and I'm sure there'll be some other thoughts about this, but we do have three members who I just want to thank who will, this is their last meeting, so. Um, you know, Mr. Orsini and Mr. Goodwin and Mr. Melchiona, I know uh, that this is your last meeting and you know, I, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Um, people don't always realize how many hours you put into this particular position. If they only think that this is the only meeting you have or this is the only time you put into it, they are, they are they're sadly mistaken about how many hours you folks put in. So I appreciate all the time you've put in the uh, open-mindedness that you bring to, to the Board of Education and just the dedication that you've shown to the students and families of, of Plymouth over the years. So you guys will be sorely missed, and I wish you guys nothing but uh, the best of luck in the future. And that, that's the end of my report. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? Okay. We're going to move on. Students. Um, let's start with Amy. Okay. So for the National Honor Society, we are doing a fundraiser for hurricane relief. 
and we're sending the money to Florida and Puerto Rico. What we're doing is we're selling bracelets and I have one of the bracelets with me. It says Terryville High School and Diana also has hers. And it says Hurricane Strong on it. We're send, selling them during lunch for $2. And um, a lot of the students have really taken a lot to participate in this fundraiser. A lot of people say, oh, I don't have $2, but then we explain what it's for, and they say, oh, okay, I'll bring money tomorrow, and a lot of them actually do. Usually people will just say that, and they'll forget, but because of the cause that it's going for, a lot of people are really interested in it, and a lot of teachers are too, and a good majority of the students in NHS have actually taken a lot of bracelets and brought them to other places like where they work, if they have family businesses they've taken them there and overall we've sold 150 bracelets which is $300 so that is really awesome and we're all very very happy about that and we're still continuing the fundraiser so we're expecting to get more money. We ordered 400 bracelets so we have almost sold all of them so that's really exciting. And also for NHS, they had the senior movie day, night, the senior movie day today. And it was, the movie was Fences with Denzel Washington. Um, there is going to be a financial aid night at the high school for any seniors and their parents who are interested in learning more about the FAFSA application and just financial aid in general. And it's October 12th at 6 p.m. in the auditorium. Uh, we are going to be having our spirit week at the high school, which is going to be October 23rd to the 27th. And each day has a specific theme, and all the students are really excited about it. Um, there's going to actually be a contest between each grade level. So the more students that participate, the more points each grade gets. And at the end of the week, at the pep rally, uh, whoever has the most points is going to get the spirit stick, which shows that this grade level has the most spirit, and there it's going to be a big competition. There's going to be other prizes, and also, even though Spirit Week is fun, it's also uh, drug and alcohol prevention and awareness, so there's going to be different speakers coming in to talk to the students about that. And as Mr. Keene mentioned earlier, the Berkshire League Music Festival is October 13th at 7 p.m. at the high school, and tickets are $10, which you could buy at the door. And the band is also doing a fundraiser at Savers, which is on October 15th and the 21st from 12 to 4. <coughs> and what the fundraiser is, this is the first fundraiser that I've ever heard that's like this, and it's pretty cool. The Items that are donated to Savers are going to be weighed on those two days, and the band is going to get a portion of the funds from it per pound. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Green your old weights. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I have. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, great. All right, I'm going to talk about, can you hear me? <laughs> I'm going to talk about sports for a little bit. Um, for our boys' soccer, they're doing really well. They're on a three-win streak, and if they keep this up, they will be going to states because right now they have a four and five, and they only need four more wins, and they're only halfway through the season. Um, for our girls' soccer, they're having a rough season, but they're putting in the effort, and they just started um, doing uh, pink socks for breast cancer awareness. And our volleyball, they're doing very well, too. They only need three more wins to get into states, and this puts them in a good spot because they're only eight games away from the end of the season, so they have a good chance of going to states. For cross country, our girls are still putting in the fight. Not so good, but they're, do they're working on it. <laughs> and for our boys, though, um, they have a good chance of winning the BLs because they um, are 7-1. and one. They only want lost to one team, so they have a good chance of winning. That's all I have. Any questions? <laughs> Okay, Diana. So there are a good handful of activities in the school coming up. On October 21st, the Lions are collaborating with our Leos, and we're going to be hosting our annual Halloween happening. And this is at the fairgrounds. And basically, the Leos just go and they work the event, but it's mostly for like 
uh, younger kids in the town, and they come, and everyone wears costumes, and they have pumpkin contests, and they have costume contests, and they have, like, a bunch of games, and they hand out candy, and then they also have, like, a haunted house, and I know they're trying to extend it, so we're going to get a whole bunch of our Leos and our drama kids, and, yeah, dramas, it's Leos, Lions, and drama, and they're all coming together, and we're going to hopefully make it really awesome, because we get a lot of kids every year. And then um, the Leos are also going to be hosting a homecoming dance in early November. And the money that we raise from ticket sales go to our canine Magnum. And so because it goes to Magnum, we always try and have police officers come and chaperone. And so that's always a lot of fun. And usually Magnum comes. So everyone takes pictures. It's, it's <laughs> and then on October 27th the 28th, the 27th is a Friday, the 28th is a Saturday, the Drama Club is putting on their fall performance, Scared Silly. And there's going to be one show Friday night and two shows on Saturday. And then outside the play, the students that are going on the Spain and France field trip are going to be running a bake sale. And then another bake sale that's being put on is the FBLA, the Future Business Leaders of America, are um, having a bake sale on Election Day, and they combine with the Rotary Club and kind of put that together. And finally, the Leo Social that was planned for October 5th has been shifted to November 2nd. Oh, also, I know Mr. Holtz already mentioned it, but today, uh, grades 9 to 11 took the PSATs, <laughs> and everything actually went really smoothly. And as someone, I've actually taken the SATs, like I took them last June, and taking the PSATs, it's a great way to kind of let you know what the test is going to be like. And it also opens up National Merit Scholarships, which is a really awesome opportunity also. Great. Did you give the um, date for the Halloween party? October 21st. Thank you. And did you get the date for homecoming? Um, that is still in kind okay. of, yeah. It's okay. not set in stone yet. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Thank you, ladies. Um, we just want to remind everybody that we are Facebook Live, so smile everybody, <laughs> say hi. <laughs> um, okay, so next on our agenda is public comment. Three minutes, please um, name, address, sign up. There's nothing to sign. Chris Simo Kinzer, 52 Old Farm Road. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the Board of Ed members, Chris, Mike, Tony, for your service and time here on the board, uh, and best of luck in what your fu next future endeavors are. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Any other qu comments? Facebook Live. Okay, we have a Facebook Live comment that I'm going to read. This is from Amy Radke. Um, for those of you that don't know, she was the former assistant principal here at the high school. She says, excellent job, THS, at improving all these test scores. I know personally how hard the staff has worked to get there. Mr. Holtz, excellent presentation and excellent job keeping the school moving forward. Mr. Vigliotti and Mrs. Parsons, great <coughs> social and emotional presentation. That is near and dear to my heart, and in my opinion, it is the most important goal to work toward. I hope that each school staff, including every staff member, is an integral part of the process. One question would be, is exactly how will that be measured? How will you know all that what you are doing is truly positively improving a student's social and emotional state? Measurable and accountable being a focus. Regarding the budget, I am very concerned about the future. My question would be as to how the list of cuts was generated. Who exactly was involved in the process? No one knows the needs of each individual school better than its administration and staff. In years past, the BOE and the superintendent would sit with those admin stakeholders to get input on what cuts could be made while doing their best to leave the integrity of the system in place. Lastly, regarding THS, I am aware that the literacy position at the high school is one of the tragic cuts. I was surprised that the position would even be considered, would, would even be cut considering the needs of our students. No one wants to need a position like that, but THS certainly does. There are many students who would have fallen through the cracks and many who would not have graduated had that position not been intact. Would certainly hope that once the state gets their head out of the sand, that would be the first one reinstated. 
Thank you for your time. And again, that's from Amy Radke. Any other comments? Okay, moving on. Unfinished business. Roxanne, that is you. <laughs> so, um, this is our series 500 policy. 5,000 policy, sorry. Um, everybody's had a chance to read it um, and reread it. So my first question is, does anybody have any questions before we go through and vote to accept it? So at this point, I would like to make a motion to accept the policy series 5,000 as presented to you. Okay, coming, from, from, coming from committee does not need a second. So any questions or comments? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you to Thank that you. committee. Roxanne, great job. Okay, next on the agenda is the consent agenda. Hope everybody had a chance to look at it. Um, I'd like to move to approve the consent agenda. Chris, second? Okay. <clears throat> any questions or comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, any opposed? Any abstentions? Moving on. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Penn, all you. <laughs> so I think Yogi Berra said it's deja vu all over again. Mm -hmm. uh, so healthy food certification has come back to us. Um, the state had originally provided language to us in the first time that we did this and then came back and said, no, that was the wrong language. So here we are again. Uh, what you're going to see presented to you in the agenda tonight, uh, consideration number one is an agreement to participate in the Healthy Food Certification Program for the 17-18 year. Uh, healthy Food Certification basically equates to about $75,000 with the state funds that we receive every year and there's certain criteria that you have to agree to participate with in terms of the food that you sell both as part of the program and so as not to have uh, competing foods being offered at the time that the meals are being served. Consideration number two um, <coughs> is an exemption for certain items that meet the three criteria that are listed in that exemption so that you can conduct fundraisers that are food-based and things along those lines by as long as it meets that criteria you can continue to do that going forward without violating the healthy food certification you're agreeing to participate in. So as it turns out, we need both one and two tonight in order to move forward with the Healthy Food Surfer Certification. Um, and I've kind of worded this in a way, I think, in the agenda so that you don't have to read the entire paragraph, but hopefully I, I'd appreciate if somebody could make a motion for each of those. I move that we adopt consideration number one regarding Healthy Food Certification as presented in the agenda. Second. Camera <laughs> first. <coughs> second. Any questions? Comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved. I move that we adopt consideration number two regarding healthy food certification as presented in the agenda. Karen? Second. <laughs> Tony, second. Any questions, comments, or concerns? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstentions? So moved. I wish they would have just said and. Right. It would have been taught. Right. <laughs> I have the next one. Um, so there's a, there's a formal process in Connecticut to actually seed a school building back to the town. Uh, and at the advice of board council, we did get the recommended motion you see in front of you tonight that would basically return control of 77 Main Street, the former Main Street School, and the former Board of Ed offices back to the town of Plymouth. So I'd be looking for a motion that reads as stated in the agenda. I'd like to make a motion that the Plymouth Board of Education relinquish to the Town of Plymouth control over all the buildings, land, apparatus, and other property located at the former site of the Main Street School, located at 77 Main Street, Terryville, Connecticut, effective October 11, 2017, in accordance with Section 10-220 of the Connecticut General Statutes as such property is no longer being used for school purposes. Second. Okay. Karen first. Uh, Roxanne second. Any questions? Comments? Concerns? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved. Thank you very much. <laughs> At this time, ladies, if you would like to leave, go right ahead. If you'd like to stay, feel free. I know a couple of you have AP <laughs> tests coming up, so... Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you. Great job tonight. Thank you. Okay, committee reports, curriculum. Hi. Um, the curriculum subcommittee met on September 19th and discussed the following. Um, our new foundation program, elementary social studies, professional learning plan, and middle school school assessments. Any Thank questions? You. Okay, moving on. Facilities? Uh, the facilities subcommittee did not meet due to lack of business. Okay, thank you. Finance? The finance subcommittee met prior to the board meeting and reviewed the accounts by facilities report for the month of September. And I would like to make a motion that the accounts by facility report will be forwarded to the Town of Plymouth Board of Finance. Coming from committee does not need a second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. We also need the transfers. Oh, yes, I'd also like to make a motion that we accept the transfers as indicated in your packet. Coming from committee does not need a second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you. Negotiations? We have not had a meeting. We will not meet again until we have a new subcommittee formed after the elections. Okay. Thank you. Personnel? Personnel subcommittee met prior to the board meeting and all items were addressed under the consent agenda. Thank you. Policy? My apologies. I mentioned negotiations will not meet. I meant policy will not meet. Okay. Uh, did not meet and will not meet. Of course, negotiations did not meet either. Okay. No problem. Safety and transportation. Uh, the safety and transportation subcommittee had a special meeting on September 20th, 2017 and discussed and finalized a current request to review a bus stop on Allentown Road. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Public comment, second one, three minutes. Chris, yours was too fast last time. <laughs> Going once. Going twice, thank you very much. Moving on, um, board liaison. Um, I'm sorry, let me pull it up. I did speak to uh, Mrs. Rohanski. Um, well, I, I guess it's gonna be for Plymouth Center too, but um, their um, conferences are next week, so they have half days. Um, the PTA does not meet till next week, so I have no report from them. And actually, that's all I have, I apologize. So that was from uh, Fisher. Plymouth Center? I was unable to attend. Okay, well, we'll just say mine's the same way then. Okay. There you go. Um, Roxanne, Eli? Yes, I met um, with the PTA on September 26th at 7 p.m. in the library at ET, Eli Terry. Um, one of the things we discussed were some of their fundraising ideas. If there's anybody out there that has a, a business and is interested <coughs> in um, advertising on T-shirts, Please contact the Eli Terry Junior Middle School PTA. You can reach them by Facebook or um, reach out to me, and I can get you in contact with them. Um, the other thing is their membership drive. They've got a fantastic membership base, and we're really looking to grow that. So as a parent of any middle school student or upcoming middle school student, if you would like to be involved, by all means, um, join us because it's a, it's a great group doing some really great things. And then the other thing we talked about was how well attended the open house was this year. Uh, it's great to see the parents there and the students, and we look forward to some more activities for this year. Great. Any questions? Okay. Karen. Yes, the Terryville High School PTSA met on October 4th. It was um, also an after-grad party, which is the primary function of that group. Um, there was lots of questions about fundraising and approval from the board and how we go about filling out the paperwork and all of that. And I'm sure somebody will be contacting somebody <laughs> there about to, that yeah. to Robin. <laughs> yep. Okay. Who knows all about it anyway? <laughs> so lots of brainstorming, lots of ideas on how we can raise money for this group of seniors and their after grad party. And they had some new ideas and some they're keeping with some of the older ideas as well and we can always use more help. So if you don't have to have a senior to be involved in the PTSA at Terryville High School, it's actually a great idea to get involved um, before your children are seniors because then when your children are seniors and you're focused on the aftergrad, you really have a really good idea of how it works. 
So I encourage all high school parents to come on out and join the PTSA. Um, I believe we will be meeting <coughs> the first Wednesday of the month here at Terryville High School. Um, again, there is a Facebook page. You certainly can join. Um, to, and if you need more information about that, reach out to me or to um, anyone you know at the high school, and they should be able to help you. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Melissa. Uh, the next SEPTA meeting is October 19th, next Thursday at 7 p.m. at Eli Terry Middle School um, Library. Thank you. Any questions? Michelle? Hi. Uh, for Ed Advance, we went over the 2017 um, budget from okay. that period. Any questions? We'll go our last one. Uh, I don't have a report because I didn't meet. But uh, I do know that there should be some information coming out on the open house, which should be the first week in November. So anybody that's interested in applying to go to Omogo, uh, take a look for that. Great. Any questions? All right. Jerry? Uh, Came did not meet on September 14th. Okay. All right. Board comments. Who would like to go first? Because I know there's going to be quite a few. Madam Chair, I would like a point of personal privilege. Absolutely. Please. Thank you. I'm changing hats for a minute. I'm, uh, I'm not speaking as a board member. I'm speaking as a member of the Terrible Fire Department. Uh, which I've been a member of uh, for 42 years and currently I'm the department's health and safety officer. I've held various positions, highest rank was assistant chief. Uh, this week is National Fire Prevention Week. Uh, it runs uh, October 8th through October 14th. Even though we started October 7th at the IJ Plaza, we do our annual uh, community safety day. Uh, it ran from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. We had a tremendous turnout. It was a beautiful day, and we got a lot of important information out to the public. Uh, but what I wanted to show is what went on yesterday and today at Plymouth Center School and Harry S. Fisher Elementary School. Uh, the fire department was in attendance, and I think did an outstanding job of bringing forth to the children an excellent fire safety program. So let me see if I can <coughs> get this to work. Okay, uh, these are the firefighters involved. I mean, uh, the guys are dedicated. We had 14 of them involved for two days, giving up their personal time uh, to be there with the students. Uh, they've been doing this for, for a few years now. Uh, initially, I started this program in 1980 and we have come a long way uh, since. And I'm very proud of uh, the gentlemen that do this. And every year, it seems to be it's a different bunch of guys. Uh, but they really enjoy what they're doing. Uh, they get involved with the children. There's a lot of hands-on, as you can see in these photos. Uh, it, it's just a super uh, program uh, and a lot of dedication. Uh, down in the lower picture there is uh, Captain Tom O'Keefe, he's from the Fall Mountain Company, and, and he enjoys doing this. He wouldn't miss uh, Fire Prevention Week activities with the children. Tom's been involved for a while. Uh, in the upper photo there you see, uh, I, I don't recognize all the individuals, but they had an opportunity to take a ride up in the bucket. <coughs> and uh, very exciting. Uh, this is uh, at... Uh, I believe this is the Plymouth Center in the uh, classroom part where uh, our lead instructor, Peter Carpenter, does an outstanding job of instructing the children. Uh, Pete's been doing this for uh, quite a few years, and Pete is the guy that I'm uh, really nurturing and bringing forward to take over my position someday. Uh, this is up at Fisher. Uh, once again, the tower was extended. Operating the tower was uh, Paul Schwanka. Uh, Paul's been a member of the department 47 years, and Paul is also a retired teacher from the town of Plymouth. Uh, 
Paul was an IA teacher at, uh, back then it was the uh, Harry S. Fisher uh, Middle School. Uh, once again, a, a lot of exciting things uh, for children and adults. Uh, this was a, a brave moment, uh, going up into that bucket, extending to uh, 90 feet. I mean, it's, uh, 90 feet is high. You may say 90 feet, what's 90 feet? But go up there in the bucket, it's high. And once again, our firefighters are trained to do that, think nothing of it, it's, it's second nature. Uh, in the photo to the right, uh, Peter Carpenter, once again, Pete gets right into it. Uh, he, uh, he's right there at, at the level of children, and he speaks to the children, not at the children. And he really, uh, he really loves what he does. And then down in the bottom one there, that's uh, Captain T.J. Zagurski demonstrating stop, drop, and roll. Uh, uh, Tom uh, Zagurski, or T.J., is a uh, captain at the Plymouth uh, Company. And once again, it just uh, it was a, it was a fun-filled uh, uh, experience for both days. The guys really enjoyed it. And when I saw the initial photos from Plymouth Center yesterday at breakfast this morning, I saw Dr. Semmel, and I said uh, I, I'd love to do this presentation just to show not only the board but the community uh, what the fire service in town is doing for for the public. And I believe that is it. Uh, so once again, uh, the gentlemen involved, I, I, I want to give them some accolades. Uh, there's Bob Telke, Plymouth Company, uh, Nick Gentile, he's a new recruit, just had his physical. Uh, he's with the Plymouth Company. Uh, Paul Schwanka, uh, he's host company number one. Uh, as I said, Paul's been around for 47 years. Uh, David Wunsch, he's one of your guys. Uh, Dave was here, Dave enjoys this. Uh, Peter Carpenter. Uh, Peter's with the Plymouth Company. Uh, David is with the latter company. Uh, Tom O'Keefe, Fall Mountain Company. Tom is the captain up there. Uh, Craig Toll, Fall Mountain Company. He's a lieutenant. Uh, T.J. Zagurski, uh, Captain Plymouth Company. Ryan Regan, Lieutenant Plymouth Company. Jimmy Hill, a, a new member to the department, Plymouth Company. Greg Kerouac, uh, Firefighter Host Company. Uh, Joe Simadon, a uh, new member also, has only been around a couple of years, but does a great job. Uh, he's with the host company, and Richie Emmons, uh, he's with the Plymouth Company, a great firefighter. And a lot of these guys, years ago, I had as students. So it's really nice to, I had them in a class at one time, and now we're on the same plane, we're working together for a common cause. Uh, w one last thing, uh, tomorrow night is our, is our big community fire drill. It's something I started in 1990, and it's still actively involved. And it's one way to get the townspeople to participate in their own home fire drill. Uh, we asked the residents and the homeowners to think about uh, two ways out in case there's a fire. One way may be blocked, so you always want that other way. And, and by practicing and going over it, especially with your family and children, uh, knowing how to escape, knowing your escape routes, uh, have your pre-planned designated meeting place, whether it be the end of the driveway, the big rock, the mailbox. Everyone knows where we're meeting because when the, uh, when the alarm sounds and the smoke detector goes off, not everyone may be walking out the front door. Maybe mom and dad may go out the front door, but the kids may go out the back door because that's the closest exit. And that's why it's so important to stress we have a common meeting place because there have been statistics out there where the kids were never told this. And as a result, mom and dad are looking for the kids and the kids are out and back playing on the swings. And uh, dad goes running back into the house looking for the kids and dad never comes out. So it's so important to stress that common meeting place. And, and the other thing I can't say enough about are our smoke alarms and CO alarms. Uh, we were very fortunate here in Plymouth uh, through the uh, through Kitta and Operation Save a Life, uh, along with Home Depot, the Bridgeport Burn Center. Uh, Plymouth received uh, 96 smoke alarms and 18 seal alarms. Uh, Kitta does this every year. They give out 5,000 smoke alarms and eight and 1,000 seal alarms. Uh, the first year I went down, this is about five years ago, we came back with 250 smoke alarms. Uh, this year we came back with 96. The reason why is more departments going. It's a great opportunity. And we bring them back and we give them out to the community. 
no charge. Uh, the CO alarms, because it's only got 18, I'm keeping those on the fire apparatus. When we do go to that CO incident, uh, if the CO meter or CO alarm is bad, we'll give them a new one. If it's defective, we'll give them a new one. If it's out of date, we'll give them a new one. If they don't have one, we're giving them one. I had a lady today uh, approach me in the IJ uh, Plaza. She said, uh, my, smoke, my smoke alarm's not working. Uh, can I get one? I mean, I, I said, yes. I said, you wait here. I'll go to the firehouse and get it. And I gave it to her because my thinking is, if I said, well, go up to the fire marshal's office and if he's not there and she goes home tonight and there's an incident, she has a fire and she couldn't get out because she didn't have a working smoke alarm, I'd feel terrible. So I did that purpose. I said, yes, you will have it in a moment. So it took me five minutes. Went to the firehouse, got it, and brought it back. But doing things of that type to keep our community safe. Uh, we're very fortunate. We have, uh, right now, we get 91 uh, volunteers dedicated to protecting lives and property of members of the town of Plymouth. And they're highly trained. Uh, our guys uh, uh, are Firefighter 1 certified, Firefighter 2 certified. Uh, the only thing that separates uh, the terrible fire department from any paid department, such as Bristol or Waterbury, is a paycheck. The training is the same, the risks are the same, and they get paid every two weeks. And we do it because we want to make sure we're going to protect our community and do what's best for our community. So with that said, I'm very proud of the Terrible Fire Department. We have an outstanding bunch of uh, chief officers, company officers, and uh, I'm glad I've been a part of it for 42 years, and I continue to be there for a long time yet. Uh, just one final comment. It was a tough decision to decide running for the board or not running for the board, but at this point in my life, I've been an educator here in the town of Plymouth for 38 years. I've been on the board already for eight years. That's 46 years. That's a good part of my life, and now I want to spend more time with my wife, my family, and especially my grandchildren. Uh, they're 8 and 11, and I know how fast kids grow. Uh, my 11-year-old granddaughter, she's in grade 6, and uh, I feel it's a uh, blink of an eye and she'll be graduating from high school. And I want to be there with them and enjoy this, because I know how fast kids grow. I, I've been involved for 38 years as a teacher, as an administrator, and, and I love my career. And, uh, and I got paid to do something I really loved. And it was just, it was amazing. Right? The best profession in the world, being an educator, working with kids. So with that said, uh, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak up here. And it's been a pleasure to be on this Board of Education for eight years. And uh, with that, good night. Thank you. Comments? I guess I'll go next. It's a tough one after Tony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, uh, a couple groups I want to thank. Uh, you know, obviously the voters of the town of Plymouth. Um, you know, when I ran for office, I was 20 years old, and uh, you know they went out on a limb and they elected me to the office. And uh, you know, I kind of I have to thank them. Uh, you know, for that opportunity. Uh, it's a, a big risk, and I appreciate that. Um, you know, obviously the administrative team, uh, you know, we're giving of ourselves to be board members, but all the information and the, uh, you know, time that you put in to help us learn so that we can make the right decisions on behalf of the voters, you know, that, that takes a lot of effort and, uh, you're away from your families on nights like this and, uh, you're getting home and the kids are asleep or, uh, you know, you're, you're eating dinner at nine, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, everybody that I have served with on the board, um, you know, we've had some very tough decisions we have to have had to make. And, uh, you know, I think the people that are here now and the people that have been in these seats uh, next to me over the past four years, I have to thank them for, uh, you know, being that support system when uh, very few other people can be that support system. Some of those decisions are tough and we can't talk about them in a public forum. So you really have to lean on the people around you uh, when you're making those tough calls. And the last person, 
um, is, is not here, um, unfortunately. But I just want to thank Pat Piskorski. Uh, you know, she has been there all four years and called and texted and just want to remind you there's a meeting tomorrow night and there's going to be there. Um, you know, that that was very helpful as a, as a board member trying to balance uh, work and uh, being on the board. Um, just a, a real helpful hand and I appreciate all her help. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be the briefest. <laughs> it's been a privilege and an honor to serve on this board with such dedicated volunteers and administrators. Uh, I appreciate what these people do, and I've learned a lot from all of you. And uh, good luck to the new board members, whoever they will be. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Any other board comments? Oh. Okay, no, go ahead. There you go. Um, so mine will be quick. For, for those that don't know, um, and, and some people don't always understand how our process works, but every two years, a good portion of this board has a changeover. So what you're going to see here uh, at the next board meeting, you are going to see two familiar faces. You are going to see three faces that definitely will not be here. And there are four faces that may or may not be here. We won't know until uh, after the election. One thing is for sure, um, whoever is sitting in these seats, they've got a lot of work ahead of them. We've come a long way as a team. And of course, there's always room for improvement. So I want to say um, good luck to everybody who's running for a new position or moving on to other endeavors. Um, Tony, I'm grateful I'll still see you in the fire services arena. Um, my, my other family, uh, you've done a f phenomenal job and, and you'll definitely be missed. Um, the other thing I want to say is uh, as chair of the policy subcommittee, two years ago we talked about setting a goal to finish the entire policy within two years and we knew that was super aggressive and Dr. Sumley said ain't happening no way ain't gonna, you're not gonna do it and, and we knew it was aggressive then yep. but I think we're what one series away one from series completing away. it yep. so one I have series. to give a shout out to the policy mm -hmm. subcommittee because there were a couple nights where I, I really wanted to stay a little longer <laughs> and they wanted to go home and, and we bit the bullet we did some special meetings but um, I have to say of all the subcommittees I've been on, that has definitely been the one that took up the most of the time and the most personal time too, because there was a lot of reading. So I have to give a shout out and thank you. Mm -hmm. And whoever the next policy subcommittee is, uh, maybe me, maybe not, uh, good luck in finishing that one <laughs> series. <laughs> I'm definitely jealous and, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to comment on Mrs. Radke. You know, I do believe she's retired in Florida. Okay, and watching Facebook and seeing what's going on, you know, that's how much interest she still has in education, even though she is retired. But she did mention one thing that uh, that I really firmly believe is in, as an educator with herself, is that she did have some uh, uh, problems with losing the literacy teacher at the high school, All right? And I know from being a past board member with other administrators that that was never high priority as a superintendent to have literacy coaches and math coaches and they would always get cut in the budget process but we did bring some on starting I believe about probably four years ago and Dr. Semmel has brought it along and now unfortunately because of the chaos that's going on in Hartford now we have to start cutting and you know, it's unfortunate that we have to cut literacy teachers because yes, by the time a kid gets to high school, if they're not reading at their grade point level and there isn't a literacy coach there to help them, you know, it's really tough to get them to graduate. So hopefully that once Hartford gets their so-called act together and decides on how they're gonna fund education in this state, um, that we can bring back these literacy teachers. Thank you, any other comments? I just want to say that it's been a privilege working with all of you and this team. Um, Michelle and I will definitely be here <laughs> for the next meeting. Um, we are the only two that are for sure going to be here, but I sure hope I see some other faces here <laughs> <laughs> next to us. But um, it's been a great pleasure, and I've been, it's been nice getting to know all of you, and you will be missed. Okay, I guess that's me next, huh? Can oh. I interject? Absolutely. <laughs> We slighted one of our Florida friends, so I have to say, um, 
Hello to David Goodwin, and yes, we know that other people in Florida are watching us too. <laughs> it's all yours. Okay. Hi, Florida. Um, well, happy retirement, Tony. You're going to be missed. Um, what I have to say is um, I have a little bit of a pet peeve because our state is one of the few states in our country that you have to have a political party to be on a board of education. And I never thought that it has anything to do with Board of Education, and we've never been there. We've never you know, put our lines down and said yes or no, Democrat, Republican. This board has worked well together. We haven't always agreed, and that's a good thing. Um, we've always come to the right conclusion for the kids, so I thank you. Um, I thank you two years ago when you um, nominated me, elected me to be your chair. It's been a privilege. Uh, I think I've always been an advocate for the past 20 years, and this kind of projects a little bit more. I can do it for more kids. Um, so it's been an honor and a privilege to do that. Thank you for all the hard work. And before Roxanne had the policy, it was mine because I love policy. And then <laughs> she took it over. She did a fantastic job. That is a huge, huge job. So thank you very much for all your hard work. Um, Chris, I can't say happy retirement. I can't. So you're too young. Mike, happy retirement. <laughs> you're not too young. Yeah. We, we can all retire, but he's you're too young to retire. Too. You're going to be missed, though. I appreciate all your help and your perspectives. I appreciated that. Um, I think that's it. And Yeah, I think that's it. Just thank you. And hopefully there will be some familiar faces. It'll be interesting next month. It'll be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so um, moving on, our next board meeting is here at the high school, November 15th, as the superintendent has said. It's a different week um, at 7 o'clock here in the cafeteria. I would like a motion to adjourn. So moved. So, <laughs> Roxanne, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you.